All right, so welcome everyone. Thank you so much for taking some time out of your busy day to join us for today's presentation. We're really excited about talking about diversified selling um, and the strategies that you can implement in your own businesses to really strengthen uh, your diversification strategy and grow your business. Just a couple housekeeping items before we get started. Um, we are open on Twitter at Rakuten SL, so if at any time you have a question for the panel that you'd like addressed during the Q&A, feel free to send it that way. Um, you can also send us a chat in the chat feature on your WebEx control panel. And we will be sharing the full recording uh, following today's webinar, so if you miss any point of it or you have to leave us a little early, don't worry, we'll be sure to send that over to you and then you can share that to any of your coworkers or anyone you think might find some insight from today's presentation. So to get us started, I would like to welcome all of today's presenters. Um, we have Michael Manzioni joining us today. He is President and CEO of Ratchet Super Logistics. Mike, would you tell us a little bit about yourself and the company? Sure. Uh, I've been with Rakuten now for about four years, uh, run the company uh, for the last year and a half. Uh, we have uh, nine current facilities in five states with uh, two opening up this summer, or late summer I should say, one in New Jersey and one in Chicago. So uh, we offer a full 3PL service for a potential e-commerce client. Very exciting, very exciting time for Rakuten Super Logistics right now. Uh, we also have Brett Rosendahl who's joining us from Rad Interactive. He is the co-founder and president. Uh, Brett, would you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, of course. So I've been in digital marketing for over 10 years now. Um, I used to work for one of the top technical companies out there, split off about six years ago to start up Rad Interactive. Um, you know, SEO and paid search, those are our two verticals, that's what we really specialize in. And I oversee, you know, the entire operation from, you know, campaign strategy and development to, you know, planning and team management. Awesome. Well, very glad that you can join us for today. Um, and then we have Andrew Maff. Andrew is joining us from Seller's Choice. He is the Director of Marketing and Operations. Andrew, please tell everyone a little bit about yourself and Seller's Choice. Sure. So I am uh, the director of marketing operations. I've been in marketing, specifically e-commerce, for a little over a decade now. Um, been in and out of multiple different marketplaces. We really focus here at Seller's Choice on a cohesive branding strategy across multiple platforms, as well as other marketplaces like Amazon, Rakuten, and uh, eBay, Jet, Walmart, all that fun stuff. Very cool. Very fun stuff indeed. All right, um, so let's move on to the agenda. Um, so today, like I said, we're going to be talking about the importance of a diversified sales strategy and that what, what that means for today's e-commerce seller. Um, then we'll take it over to Brett to talk about implementing an SEO strategy that will attract new shoppers and a new audience. Um, and Andrew will take it away with branding to create a loyal customer base and really grow your business over the long term. Um, to close, we'll have a Q&A, so please be sure to jot down, send over any questions that you might have for any of our panel, and we'll be sure to address those at the end of the presentation. All right, so with that, I will send it over to Mike. Thank you, Carolina. So, you know, we have a unique uh, opportunity here to have uh, two great presenters uh, with Andrew and, and Brett, and so what I'd like to do is kind of maybe just hit the stage here a little bit for them. Uh, and if you look at the e-commerce marketplace today, uh, the, the players are, are increasing and the number of platforms that you can sell from are uh, increasing dramatically. And so, you know, the shopper today, the consumer today has more opportunities to find a product more in more places than ever before. So marketing, uh, from our perspective, becomes a very, very key aspect in your company's success. And I think these two gentlemen will give us a lot of uh, insight to how we can be successful or how we can help you. From Rakuten Super Logistics perspective, it's interesting because we're on the sidelines just as a fulfillment company. And we really get to experience with many different companies what makes them successful and not. And so we kind of want to set the stage by giving you a few of those things that we think uh, that lead to that. <clears throat> 
So first of all, you know, Amazon is, is a wonderful marketplace, uh, and obviously we all know it's very dominant. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with uh, advertising and, and selling in, in, in Amazon. In fact, we encourage it. We think it has a great place in your strategy. Um, however, um, you can see by the slide here that it is so dominant that it kind of creates a situation where if you look at one of the common areas that a lot of companies fail in is when they solely rely on Amazon as their the single platform they sell from. And so one of the things that we encourage you in this, in this, in this era of uh, price disruption, and which is now trans transformed into a product disruption, is to uh, to really look at other options just besides Amazon. A couple of uh, you know examples here of things that we hear from sellers is that um, you know, if you look at the average one million plus seller that in in Amazon, 66% of them fear being banned from from the marketplace, as well as 64% of them are concerned about Amazon being one of their competitors. Which, which just further reinforces why you need to diversify your portfolio and sell on multiple platforms. Um, we, we certainly think that the best platform that you should sell on is your own platform, and the more you can move traffic through your own platform, the better you'll be successful, and use the other platforms as a way to diversify your portfolio, test your product, um, and, and really understand the pricing um, metrics and dynamics that you need to use to sell better on your own platform. So we, we certainly suggest a diversified you know, sales strategy where Amazon certainly plays a part of it, but also all your other websites uh, and stores can play a part of it. Um, and and, I, and I, again, I can't reinforce, when we look at the clients that are really, really successful, um, they really have a strong presence on their own website. Their own website drives a significant part of their own traffic, and the other platform platforms just add additional revenue to it. We see three different uh, components to a successful company. So we, you know, you certainly we can probably drive, drive this list down to 10 really specific things when we look at it. But to simplify, we really think there are three areas to be successful in e-commerce, and these are the three that we believe um, really lead to a successful e-commerce company. And, and so the first one I'm going to share with you is obviously the product or branding side. You have some companies have a great, they do a great job on, on um, branding. And they may not even have a great product, per se, but their branding is so good and their messaging is so good they can be successful. You have other companies that have great products, uh, and they sometimes have great branding or not. Uh, we see the common issue here being that a lot of companies have a common product that many other people sell, which means your branding and your marketing is, becomes even more important. And that's the second component to this, having a strong marketing uh, strategy, uh, investing uh, deeply into marketing for your success in e-commerce store is critical. There, there is, is direct correlation between your investment in marketing and your success with your, with your storefront. And the third part is customer engagement. We see companies that own the customer engagement um, really have a, have a better sense of, of how to react to their customers and how to uh, modify their strategy to be successful. And so from our perspective as a 3PL, we see if you have these three components fully engaged and that's where you're really focusing your time, you'll be very, very successful. With that said, let's go ahead and move on to um, uh, Brett, who's going to talk to us now about the SEO side of the, the, the equation for on the marketing. Brett? Yeah, sounds good. Well, thanks a lot, Mike. So, yeah. Um, Let's talk a little bit about SEO, about how important it is. Um, you know, so first off is, you know, why does a website need SEO? And, and some key takeaways here are, you know, search right now is growing at nearly 20% per year. So, you know, if you're not, you know, getting in front of the actual people, it's, it's, you're, you're going to start getting me left, you know, left behind. Um, search engines definitely provide targeted traffic. Um, you know, higher rankings in the first few results are critical to visibility. So, you know, you can't have everything up in those top positions, but as long as you're continuing to grow your overall first page presence, you're going to be able to get more in those top positions. It really makes a big difference in terms of where you're located there on the first page. Um, you know, your customers are definitely searching for companies like yours, and your competitors are most likely doing some sort, um, some sort of digital marketing and, and most likely SEO. So, you know, what are the benefits of SEO? 
we can go ahead to the next slide. Yep. So what are the benefits of SEO? Um, there's quite a few of them. So, you know, long-term ROI is a big one. Long-term credibility and positioning. Increased brand awareness. Um, you know, you're going to bring visitors with higher purchase intent. You'll be able to drive online and offline consumer leads, which are calls. And you'll also be able to help, you know, drive more online direct and referral leads. And SEO is definitely cheaper than pay-per-click. You know, pay-per-click, um, you know, fees with Google and whatnot. You know, we have a real close-knit team at Google. We get a lot of the inside scoop there. But fees have definitely been increasing as well. So I'd also like to talk about um, the digital marketing trifecta. So, you know, think of and, and, and think of earned, owned, and paid media like, like a tripod. Um, you know, each element is important to the whole, you know, and all contribute to complete, you know, digital marketing strategy. But this, you know, illustration really outlines each element's role and how they work together to, for, to you know, form really a cohesive marketing mix. Um, you know, one of the most effective driving forces of earned media is usually combined with the result of strong organic rankings of the search engines you know, and content distributed by the brand. First page rankings and good content are typically the biggest drivers. Rankings on the first page of the search engines place your own media sites and content links in a position to really receive higher engagement shares. And this is why, you know, good SEO strategy is, is very, very crucial. So I'd say, you know, a key takeaway around this, you know, earned media is the equivalent of online word of mouth and is the vehicle that drives traffic, engagement, and sentiment around a brand. Um, you know, there are different ways a brand can garner earned media, but, you know, good SEO and content strategies are probably the most controlled and effective. And, you know, once you can actually do this, it's going to be hard for competitors to really catch up once you've established a real, real good strategy. So as far as an actual SEO process, you know, I'm sure you guys are aware of it. There's a lot of different um, things going on in the SEO world. You can talk to a lot of different people. You could probably get a lot of different answers. There's definitely a lot of fad in the SEO industry as well. So you want to make sure, you know, you have a very solid white hat strategy. Um, the way our process works, you know, we're a technical SEO agency. You know, we focus on page, you know. Um, Really, the first week of an actual campaign, if you're working with an agency or you decide to do this in-house, is you really want to do all the proper keyword and market research. You know, you want to run an audit of your site to get an idea of what's 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 doing well, what's not doing well. Um, you know, you guys are already probably pretty familiar with your company and your customers, but really, you know, you don't want to limit yourself to, to keywords. You know, the the goal is to you can't just go after all the really broad stuff. You know, you know, if you're a Google or whatnot or an Amazon, you've got a super, super high domain authority. But, you know, with a real good strategy, it's always ideal to go after, you know, all the very important core keywords that you want to target, but then also go after all the different derivatives and variations of those keywords because really everyone searches a little bit differently online. And there's a lot of different third-party third, third party tools that you can use. Um, if you guys are currently doing, you know, AdWords or, you know, Bing, um, you, you can get an idea of what keywords convert well on the actual paid side, and you can incorporate that stuff in your actual organic side as well. But, you know, you've got your Bright Edge platforms, your STM rushes, SpyFoos. They all have different keyword databases, but it's going to be a real goal, good to go after, you know, an all-encompassing all group of keywords because you're not going to be able to rank for everything. And then once you, you know, have that list together, um, jumping into really like a, the second part of a campaign would be an initial SEO restructure. So, you know, there's a lot of different crawlers out there. We have our own proprietary patented software. We actually hired an engineer that used to work at one of the two major search engines and brought him on board. So we have our own proprietary bot, which emulates search engine spider behavior. So, you know, we recommend really going in, running an audit on the site to look at the actual layout, the architecture of the site, to really go in and fine tune it. And before you guys just go in and start updating, updating things like title tags and meta descriptions and making updates to your content, you know, you really want to get into analytics, um, you know, sort it by organic entrances to see exactly, you know, which pages are performing really well right now, which ones aren't, which ones are kind of medium in the road. Um, you know, if you go in and make, you know, changes right away to some of your higher performing pages, maybe you change a title tag, you know, that can definitely have a negative impact on the site. So you want to make sure you're do you know, doing it right. I recommend working with an agency that really specializes in this. Um, you know, for, for you guys, my recommendation, if you're going to be doing it on your own, you can definitely do some research around this. 
Um, but writing very good quality, unique content for your site is going to be very, very important as well. But once you go in, restructure the site in terms of you know architecture, layout, content, you know all your metadata. Um, you push all those updates live, and then you're actually in the actual second phase of a campaign. And in order to really get to the first page and stay on the first page and move up the first page, there's a lot of stuff that you have to do on an ongoing basis in order to achieve those results. So, you know, it's SEO, it's not a one and done thing. You have to be in there, log into your CMS, literally daily, weekly, and really feeding Google very strategic updates as they go and continue to recache and re-index your pages. That's what Google's doing. They're crawling your site on a daily basis. You know, they're they're sorting out all the HTML, they filtered in their database, and then of course the result is given to the actual end user. But um, my recommendation is you want to constantly crawl your site, you know, as you're building new pages. Um, you want to be making constant content updates, so adding fresh, unique content to, you know, category level pages, product pages are going to be very unique. Um, you know, you don't want to add too much content at the top of the page because you'll start to push products down below the fold and that can have an issue with conversion. So having a smaller content block at the top of the pages and then, you know, kind of feeding the rest at the bottom of the page, which that's not going to interrupt mobile experience. And, and really it's just there for the search engines. But really you need to find someone that's going to be making constant updates to your title tags, to your meta descriptions. You want to update heading tags. Your internal link structure is super, super key. And then, um, again, there's a lot of other third-party tools out there um, where you can find a lot of your striking distance keywords. Those are all the rankings that you have ranked from page 2 to page 10 of Google. So that's a lot of the stuff that you can go in and actually incorporate in the strategy as well. But um, I would stay away from, you know, any agencies that will guarantee results. That's usually a big red flag. Um, like I mentioned, there's a lot of fads in the SEO world, um, you know, building links through blogs. Once Google shut that down, people moved to guest blogging. Um, after that, people started building links through infographics, which that never really worked that well. Um, you know, .ed links, that was the big one that Google just kind of shut down. And right now, content marketing is the big fad in the SEO world. So content is super important. So you're going to need it on your pages to rank. But um, I think, you know, content with a, you know, a technical SEO service, you can definitely get some, some, some real, real good results. But that's kind of what we're looking like on the actual SEO process. Um, you know, again, you just have to be real, real careful on fads. There might be something that comes out that works well, you know, short term. But you definitely don't ever get, you know, hit with any manual action, manual action penalties on your actual website. You know, that can definitely be a really, really, really bad thing. But, um, that's kind of what I have to say regarding the uh, SEO process. Great. Thank you cool. uh, very yeah. much. That was some real good information. We'll come back to the Q&A mm -hmm. part in a few minutes for you because I'm sure we have some questions regarding the SEO. So let's go ahead and, and move to the branding side. And, and Andrew, if you take it away. Yeah, I, I mean, touched on on the SEO side of things very well, obviously. Um, I, I know that the past slide we talked about, you had mentioned um, <clears throat> product description and stuff like that. That's actually one of the things that we really like to focus on when we do SEO on our end, because it, the keyword research, all that, right on par, you know, exactly. Making it more fun, though, is where you can really – kind of give out your own brand voice. We, we actually see a lot of sellers, even on, on sites, on their own website, but also on their Amazon listings or on their eBay listing or anything like that, if you have a product description that's fun, like we, we went through and did a client once where we actually just, each product description wasn't necessarily a description specifically about the product, but it was actually a story about how someone used the product. But it was a completely made-up story. It was hilarious. It got a ton of traction from people just saying, like, hey, you need to come read this. Like, this is hilarious. So we were bringing off traffic from just people who enjoyed the content. Now, obviously, we still made sure it was keyword-heavy to make sure that you're still ranking where you want to rank. But to us, it really comes down to, to brand loyalty. You can fight all day for keywords that you want to fight for, like, oh, hey, you know, I want to rank for this. I want to rank for that. How do I get to page one for this? But the one keyword that's the easiest for you to fight for is your own is your own word. It's your own brand name. So it's a lot easier for for me to rank for Andrew Math than it is for a guy from Florida. Like that's impossible in some cases. Um, plus, there's benefits to building your own brand later on down the line besides just you know uh, getting more word of mouth. And you go to the next slide. Is um it, a lot of people obviously you, you build a business. Nine times out of ten, your goal is to sell it one day and start over or to just make a ton of money and retire. It's a lot easier to get a higher multiple 
on an acquisition when you try to sell your business later on if you have a brand because now you have a community. You have people that you can consistently reach out to. You have all these people that are, are easier to keep building that brand than it is if you're just transacting all the time. If you're an Amazon seller who's constantly fighting with which keyword to use or, hey, I want to tweak this because it's going to get me you know, 0.0001% more conversions every month and I'm going to make $50 more a month, that's great. Good for you. But if you're building a brand, you can actually sell it later on down the line. It becomes an investment, and it takes your company and turns it into an asset instead of just some transacting machine. Um, plus, the benefit behind that, which would be next slide, product launches, when you have your own brand, 10 times easier than if you don't. If, you, if you're sitting here and you have a site and you don't have an email list, you don't have a social media following, you're just focused on driving traffic to your website, transacting, and then kicking everyone else to the curb, you're not going to have anything. And if, when you have a new product, you can go, hey, this is another great aspect of my product line. You have no one to tell it to. So building a social media presence, building an email list, having a brand that people want to follow and people can really get involved in is where it becomes a lot easier to launch a new product. I can just tell people, hey, uh, to, to my community, to my social followers, to my email list, hey, I have a new product. Um, you guys should check it out. And then sales go up. And if I send them to Amazon, that immediately helps with reviews and, and uh, my organic ranking. Or if I'm sending them to my own site, it just brings in more people. It's an, a lot easier to do new things and to grow your business if you have your own brand. We can go to the next one. <clears throat> So this, this is kind of like how I had spoken about earlier. This is, I went and found, I wanted to find a good example for this. So this was, I searched the Dyson vacuum filter. This is Dyson's actual vacuum filter. It's not a knockoff. It's not someone else's. This is doing $10,000 a month. From what we're able to tell, I used a mix of Jungle Scout and Unicorn Smasher to give me a guess. And it was ranked number seven. It's not number one. It wasn't even being advertised. And the reason is because people searched the specific name and saw the word Dyson and went for them. So by just building their own brand, they just feel more comfortable and they have much more brand loyalty to going specifically to Dyson. So as Dyson started to build their own brand, they didn't have to continue to fight for vacuum filter or for... Um, you know, uh, ways to fix my vacuum. They're literally just fighting for their own word, which you'll never compete with them with because that word's on every page that they have and people have started to really bring their own traction to the, to the brand name. Um, so we can go to the next slide. So this was, um, this is a client we started to work with where it, we started to make every marketplace and every site, everywhere that this uh, seller is, we wanted their listings to look exactly the same. And the reason really is being that if you want to shop on Amazon or if you want to shop on eBay, you want to shop on Rakuten or you want to shop on their own site, you want your customer to still feel comfortable with your brand and they want to know that they're getting a quality product because they've shopped with you before or they have you know, some kind of insight to your brand. So you want to go in, you want to make the voice sound the same, you want the titles to look as, as best as they can. Sometimes you have to tweak the titles because everyone's algorithm is different. Um, but the, the, uh, the descriptions, the imagery, everything that you can should all look exactly the same. So no matter where they find your product, it always looks the same and you have that consistency and they don't have to worry about if it's a knockoff or not. So just like this next slide, even on what we've started to, to, uh, to do with some sellers is actually adding buttons on their site that are linking to the listings in other, in other platforms. Like in this, in this example, we, we were, um, decided that they should probably put an available on Amazon site and it links them directly to their listing. And so now they're pushing all their traffic to their website. But if someone is more comfortable with shopping on Amazon, they're going to leave this site and they're going to start searching for this product, but then they're going to come across the competitors, they're going to come across people that are bidding on their keywords, they're going to come across a ton of other options and they may start to shop around. In this case, you can actually send them directly to Amazon. So they're going straight to your product listing and they're shopping with you. Now you can add other ones. You can add available on eBay, available on Jet, available on Walmart, Rakuten. You can add as many as you need to so that no matter where your customer is comfortable with shopping, you can let them go shop there. If you take a note from Amazon, Amazon is, they don't care about their sellers. If, if anyone here is an Amazon seller, which I'm sure a bunch of you, if not all of you are, 
They never answer your questions. It takes forever to get an answer. It's because they don't care about their sellers. They're a little more inclined than how is the consumer's experience. And if you're not doing well, they're going to suspend you before they even find out if it's your fault or not. So take a page from them and just focus more on the consumer and less on the algorithm. Focus on if they're comfortable on shopping on Amazon, send them there. If they want to go to eBay, send them there. And a lot of people say, okay, but I'm sending them off my site. You can offer a smaller discount to make sure uh, a less price on your site, or you can offer them a discount if they're like a first-time shopper to keep them shopping on your site and get them comfortable with the situation. Or what you can do, which we kind of found a little bit of a hack on, is at least for the Amazon option, Amazon has an affiliate program. You can sign up for the affiliate program. The link for that button on available on Amazon actually ends up going through this client's affiliate program and they actually get a small kickback from Amazon because you're sending traffic to Amazon. They actually don't mind. In fact, part of the, the uh, uh, information they have encourages it. So we actually are still seeing a slightly better profit margin from the Amazon traffic that we're driving from off Amazon. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so for us, with the branding, it, it really is a real estate game. It's a matter of being everywhere that you possibly can. Like I would mentioned, if they want to shop on Walmart or Sears or Amazon or anywhere else that they can possibly go, you have to be everywhere that you can possibly think of so that your consumer is coming across in the right places. Let's say that, you know, obviously Amazon's the big winner. They're the ones that are doing the best. Um, but that doesn't mean there's not people that are shopping on Walmart. That doesn't mean there's not people that are shopping on Jet. Um, that doesn't mean you should ignore eBay. You're, you need to know where your consumer is, and you need to be there. And you need to be in front of them as much as you can. That doesn't mean posting on Facebook every five minutes. That doesn't mean tweeting every second you can think of. It's really a matter of just making sure that you have a presence somewhere so that they can, they can be happy because, hey, I like to use Instagram, but I hate to use Google+. Plus or I like to use LinkedIn, but I don't use Quora. Like, you need to be in certain places because not every consumer is the game, is in the same place. Plus, in certain aspects, which we've seen happen many times, and it becomes kind of a pain, is if you only have a presence on Facebook and you only have a presence on Instagram, but you're like, ah, I don't want to have a, a presence on Twitter, and then your company starts to grow and you realize, okay, I should probably be in other places, you have to be play defense and be everywhere else because your competitors may have grabbed your username, which I've seen happen many times. Or your competitors may be going after a market that's on Pinterest that you weren't originally doing. So there's a lot of other options on where you need to be to get more consumers, but also to make sure your competitors aren't getting them. So you go to the next slide. Um, so when we when we did these uh, slides, there was a note in here of like come up with actionable stuff. So I was like, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna figure out <laughs> the best you. stuff that I can do. <laughs> I was like, done. So so I made a list. So the Facebook ad thank you campaign. Don't know. I understand why no one wants to do this, and it's really because there is no um, there's no return. <laughs> there's no immediate return. So if I'm running a thank you campaign and I tell a client like, hey, you got 1,500 likes in the past month from the thank you campaign, they're gonna go cool, how much did those people buy? And you're like, well, they had already bought. And they're like, so I spent that money, it was on nothing. But what you're doing is you're building the community and you're getting more people into an area where you can actually start to re-engage them, bring them into new campaigns, help create other audiences on Facebook. You can do a lot of other stuff by just keeping them in your community as best as possible. The next one is personalized pop-up. So we, uh, we personally use Privy. Um, there's a bunch of others out there where you can actually personalize some of these. We don't suggest going really personal. Like, don't don't have it be like, hey, Zach, welcome back. Like, that's creepy. <laughs> what you want to do is you can do like, hey, you came from, you can do it where it's like uh, if the, the URL is from Instagram. So you can do like, hey, thanks, Instagram. Uh, you know, thanks for following us on Instagram. Here's, um, you know, here's a bunch of stuff from Instagram, or you can do, uh, you know, thanks for checking out all of our emails because you just had the UTM tag from your email. Like, there's ways that you can personalize it, but in a category without getting super specific. Like, hey, Zach, thanks for you know, coming back. I was Florida. <laughs> like, that gets, that gets creepy, so I don't suggest doing that. Um, we set up automated emails uh, of a new customer and a repeat customer, so thank you for shopping with us, um, and then thank you for shopping with us again. It does, and we don't ask for anything. We don't give them a coupon. We don't do anything. It's literally just a person. In a lot of cases, it's personalized thank you. It's like, hey, this is so-and-so with so-and-so. 
uh, you don't even have to be the founder. You can be like, I'm the, you know, the, the guy who manages the emails here, and I just wanted to say thank you for shopping with us. Like, it's literally just to let them know that there is someone here. You'll actually be shocked at how many people respond to those if it sounds like it's from a certain person, and they feel more comfortable if they're shopping with a person and not just a robot. Um, we do giving them a little something extra, like, hey, throw a sticker in the box, um, you know, give them a, send them a free example, uh, send them an ebook uh, in their email that they weren't expecting. There's always a little something extra that you can give them that is relatively inexpensive that will get people talking. Like a lot of people are into these, um, uh, I forgot what it's called, but like where they open the box and it's like a, like a reveal of buying the product or something like that. Like no one seems to like, I would put confetti in a box if I could have it like blow up every time someone opened a box or something like that. Like give them <laughs> something a little extra to talk about. Just because they bought with you doesn't mean that the relationship should end there. Um, investing in customer service, that's a big one. I, most of the time when you hear people talking about word of mouth, to me it's like, well, you know, I wasn't happy with this product and then they actually let me keep it, sent me a refund and sent me a new product. Like, it was amazing. Like Stuff like that, like really talented, good customer service people who really put the consumer first is really what helps in the word of mouth and can make your brand a lot more of uh, a lot more brand loyalty, pretty much. Um, and then, of course, you have your loyalty programs uh, suggesting people to do to come in. You can share your Facebook posts. I actually think these don't work great for everyone. I think they really only work well if your com if your company has a very good uh, social presence, or if you ha if you're very social friendly. Um, so, like beauty products, um, alcohol products, drinks of any kind. DIY stuff, like that kind of stuff works very well. There's some where this doesn't work too well. Like we have some B2B products where I'm like, eh, these don't work that great. Um, but that's why I put that little asterisk next to it. Um, but those are my, those are my uh, things that I suggested, like go do that. That's my slide. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Those are some great suggestions for everyone. And actually, speaking of giving everyone a little something extra, um, before we move on to the Q&A, Brett and Andrew were so kind to give everyone that's listening in um, a free offer to spend a little one-on-one -on -one time with them. Uh, Brett, mm -hmm. do you want to tell everyone a little bit about the SEO analysis? Yeah, great. So yeah, we're, we're definitely offering up um, a free consultation. So we'd love to hear from you guys, you know, if you have any questions regarding anything that we went over. And then, yeah, we'd love to be able to go in and do some preliminary analysis, you know, crawl the site, get an idea of kind of what's going on with your site, you know, show you some stuff that you're doing good, possibly show you some stuff, of course, what you're not doing good and, you know, how you can probably approve that as well. So, yeah, we can actually run a, a full Radbot of the site, Radbot crawl. Over here on the right-hand side are just some of its capabilities. Again, <laughs> uh, to learn more about this, you can go to our website or I would prefer, yeah, if you want to just reach out to us. Um, we'll give you a full live demo of this and, you know, really explain what sets us apart from, you know, a lot of the other SEO agencies out there. But, uh, yeah, we're excited to, uh, to go through all that with you. Thanks, Brett. And if they mm -hmm. do want to take advantage of this, they can just email you directly at brett at radinteractive.com? Yep, that's correct. That's brett with one T, yep, at radinteractive.com. Perfect. And, Andrew, I believe you have a little something special for the audience as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I mentioned a couple automated emails. Uh, so we did a whole ebook on automated emails, at least like the basic ones that we think everyone should have set up, and it's between I think eight and ten. Um, so it's an ebook; it's not gated. You can just go to uh, it's a Bitly, so bit.ly/slash/autoemails-sc. It's not gated. I'm not asking for your email; it'll immediately download. Just have at it. Uh, and then uh, we'll do a 30-minute uh, marketing consultation. We'll go through every aspect of your marketing um, that we can. I promise I won't try to sell you on anything. I will just go. I don't care if you have an entire in-house team. I just really enjoy doing it. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll sit down and I'll, I'll dig through everything for you. Awesome. Thank you for that. And yeah. here at Rakuten Super Logistics, we also have um, a complimentary shipping analysis that we're offering you. So if you are interested in expanding um, your e-commerce uh, channels to other multiple marketplaces and you think that there is an advantage in shipping from multiple facilities, um, we'll do a shipping analysis so that you could see what the most cost-effective shipping methods would be depending on your customer demographics um, as well as what uh, cost savings you could possibly see um, shipping out of one facility, two, three, four, et cetera. 
So if you want to take advantage of this, email is there below. We'll be sending this, uh, this presentation to everyone, so you'll have everyone's contact information. All right, and with that, I want to take this to our favorite part of the presentation, which is the Q&A. Um, if you haven't already submitted any of your questions for our panel, please do so. Uh, you can do that on Twitter, at Rocky10SL, or you can do that in that chat feature there on your uh, control panel. You guys ready for some questions? I'm ready. Let's do it. Yes. Let's do it. Okay. All right, so um, let's get started. I have one here. Um, I guess this would be for Brett. What are the top three criteria uh, to consider when you're vetting an SEO company? Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> so top three, um, to keep it kind of short and sweet, I would say the first thing is, you know, really setting goals for yourself, um, knowing what you kind of want, you know, once you contact you know, of course, you just want to reach out to one agency, but you know, maybe reach out to a handful. But really setting goals, having a very good white hat strategy. You know, stay away from anything that's you know gray or black. Um, you know, being transparent with a company that's going to be important. There's a lot of agencies out there that talk a good game and then they don't tell you what they do. Um, that's that's a red flag. So I think finding a transparent company and that's actual the reporting as well. Um, you know, not just some kind of, you know, very vague reporting, you know, you want to have very detailed ranking reports, diving into analytics, going through those organic funnels, um, you know, paid funnels direct, of course. So I'd say reporting and transparency would be two. And then three, I would say really proven results. Um, you know, just because, you know, on their proposal or whatnot on their website, they've got some fancy, you know, flashy clients on there. Um, get references and call them, you know, don't, don't just take it for word and, you know, be, you know, say, oh, you see a, a big brand, they must be a really good company, you know, make sure you find references. If you can find, if you're e-commerce, find e-commerce e -commerce references. Um, talk to them, you know, and, 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 and have some good questions for them to answer. Don't just say, hey, you know, how was it working with them? Did you make a lot of money? You know, have, go in there having some prepared questions. But yeah, I'd say goals, strategy, um, reporting and transparency, and then yeah, just uh, references would be that final one. Great tip. Thanks, Brett. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, listener asks, I currently sell products on Amazon and my own Shopify store. Uh, to remain competitive on Amazon, I often have to offer products at a lower price. How do I prevent future marketplace additions from cannibalizing sales from my Shopify site? Uh, I can touch on that one. So uh, everyone always worries about being um, you know, priced under their competitors, um, which really at a certain point, if you continue to do that, it's really just going to belittle your brand or it's going to belittle your entire product. A lot of people, you'd be surprised that they may not necessarily want the cheapest product. A lot of consumers will actually go and find like the cheapest one and then they'll go like just like a couple bucks above that uh, because it, it sounds like your product is cheap and it's going to break and it's not going to last. So I wouldn't worry so much about pricing. I would focus a little bit more on how you're driving the traffic to Amazon and how you're branding it because if you're branding it correctly or, or if you're listing your imagery, if you can make your imagery look like it's a premium product, then no one's going to care if it's cheaper. You're still going to see higher conversions than your competitor is going to. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, let's see. Tiffany, hi Tiffany, uh, would like to know, um, what do you do when other competing companies buy your products and then return them on Amazon and state to Amazon that the item is something else than what you're selling? For example, used versus new, not working. How would you provide customer service for something like this? So they're buying your product turn them on Amazon and they say to Amazon the item is something else than what you're selling. It's just an annoying competitor. <laughs> um, basically, <laughs> I, I think that, I don't think that that's like, how do you provide customer service or something? You should always be customer friendly and if they're leaving you a review that's negative or something like that, then you always have to respond appropriately. Um, you know, and, and it's not always like, oh, we're so sorry, like, please, you know, send us an email. It really could be a little more of like, it, it could be comical in, in some cases, depending on the product line. You still want to stick to your, your voice that you're using. 
But if your competitor is buying your product and they're returning to Amazon, I wouldn't worry so much about it unless it's like consistent. Then I would find a way to create a support ticket and see if you can get Amazon to not let them do that or to basically uh, see if you can prove to Amazon that they did receive what they ordered and make the competitor like be forced to buy it. Good advice. Hope that helps, Tiffany. Um, here's a question. Um, Mike, maybe you can chime in on this one. Uh, what are some of the challenges you've seen clients face when launching a new marketplace? How are they overcome? Well, I, I think typically it's the, the messaging piece that they probably struggle with, and they think that what worked on one website on what plat, plat, one platform works on another. And, and if you listen to our, our commentators today, they, they really were specific about making sure the strategy is appropriate for the platform that you're addressing and you're evaluating that. So I, I think there's, there's, on one hand, you can duplicate the, the same information from one platform to the other, and I think that's a good starting point. But I would also suggest not to just rely on that because your customer base might be different and your audience might be different, and I think you need to make sure you pay attention to that. Great, thanks. Uh, Andrew, Brad, do you have anything to add to that? I, I think I think Mike, I think I think you kind of hit the nail on the head. I think that was pretty good. Yeah, well done, Mike. Well done, Mike. Nothing to add. <laughs> I'm moving. I'm moving my hat to marketing next. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. How do I establish brand loyalty in an industry that is highly commoditized? Mm. Good one. Brand loyalty in industry. Um, I feel like that's kind of dependent on the industry. There's different approaches you can go. Like sometimes there's like there you have certain like B2B markets where it's you really need to focus less on the the product and more on your knowledge of the industry. Um, so especially on the B2B side, you know, we'll focus on like ebooks and blogging and, and making sure that you know people are like, oh, they they know what they're talking about, so their products must be good. Um, or you have the other side of things where it's just an incredibly competitive market and it's something where everyone is selling the same thing, then you really need to focus more on the story you're trying to sell as, as well as the lifestyle that you believe a majority of your customers are living. Um, it, it really can depend on, on the category and the product line, really. Mike. Yeah, I, I, I would add that um, going back to some of the comments that uh, – was in uh, Andrew's presentation. I mean, I, I think you know, content is is king, and even if it's commodity, typically you can relate some kind of content to your product to to, to maybe make it seem more unique or or that you're uh, you're a little bit different. I think also the way you take care of your clients is another way of separating yourselves from from the competition and establishing your brand. And the third thing in the list that Andrew gave of of suggestions to uh, to clients, what we, we we love one of them. We see a lot of clients that offer something unique on their website that they don't offer on the other platforms that helps drive uh, clients to their own website. And uh, whether it's a, a certain color, a certain model, a certain product that is similar to other products sold on, on the other platforms, but you can't get it, you have to come to them to get it. Or maybe there's an add-on that you add to your product so that uh, it makes your product a little bit more special by adding a special giveaway to it. I think those are ways you can maybe separate yourself from the competition. Yeah, like there's like things like coffee brands or like or oh man or like the craft beer people. Like it's beer. Like there's <laughs> there's no difference. There's the branding is completely <laughs> off. It's completely different. Yeah, it's, there's different flavors and there's different tastes, but they're all so close now at this point that it's really just the branding. And and that's a, a good point Mike brought up too is. Like here in the office, we have uh, an entire staff who is obsessed with Gymshark. <laughs> and they don't sell on Amazon. They don't sell anywhere else except on their website. It's just gym clothes. Like it's nothing crazy, but they have such a strong brand and they have that tiny hint of exclusivity of by only being able to shop on their site that it works great for them to the point where half the team takes a break every time they do a flash sale. <laughs> wow. That is some brand loyalty <laughs> right there. <laughs> All 
Brett, uh, for someone who is managing their own SEO, mm -hmm. how often does it need maintenance and updates? Yes, that's a good one. So with SEO, you want to be very active on your website. Google is constantly crawling your website, so you want to look very relevant and, and, and proactive to them. So, you know, you want to be making updates at least weekly on the actual site. Um, you know, having a blog on your site, that's, you know, of course, preferably forward slash off the domain. Um, you know, maybe writing in there, you know, once, twice a week. That's going to be a nice new steady stream of content as Google goes and crawls your site. And then, yeah, as far as adding fresh content to pages, it's going to be very important for a lot of your, you know, category level pages and stuff like that. If you don't have content on your pages, that's a problem. Um, you might see, well, some competitors don't have it, but they rank for it. Well, their domain authority might be a lot higher than yours, too. So, yeah, being very active, um, you, you can't overdo it. Um, so I'd say just adding fresh content, rewriting content, and then as far as, you know, analyzing pages, you know, on the technical side of things, as far as, you know, adjusting titles and metas and making sure you talk about the keywords the right amount of time. So, yeah, daily, weekly, for sure. So you think that uh, the more is better approach is is what people should go with for SEO? Uh, well, it, it depends on kind of what you're doing, of course. But, you know, Google loves fresh content. Like Mike mentioned, content is king. It definitely is. Of course, you have to do a lot of other stuff to back up the content to rank for what you want to target. But, yeah, being very active on your site in terms of on-page is definitely be important. And social, too. You know, if... Um, one thing that kind of Andrew brought up is, you know, it's not all about the likes and stuff like that, but if you can write something very quirky or something that really people like and they share it, those shares are what actually can help with SEO as well. And yeah, Brett, I, I, um, I, you I, meant... Uh, Go ahead, Andrew. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, I was just going to piggyback on that. The the content side of things, like, especially, and it ties into the branding and it obviously it helps with the SEO, but some of, like, <clears throat> some of the clients we work with now, like, they're doing things that are, they're doing blog posts that are relevant to the lifestyle but have nothing to do with the product. You're giving, you're basically giving the, com the consumer more reasons to come to their site even if they don't need to buy. Like I have no desire to buy right now but this is a really interesting piece. I'm going to, I'm going to see what this is about. Like uh, uh, I just sat in and we were at IRC last two weeks ago now and there was a guy who had a, they sell knives but they had consistent blog posts of stuff about knives. It wasn't about their knives. It wasn't about anything else. It was about outdoor stuff and, and reasons to use knives in certain scenarios or cooking and all that extra stuff, and it was just consistent content. But they blasted out on social and their email list, and they had such a strong community that they would all come back to the site to read this piece, which helped with their SEO. Makes sense. Um, and, Brett, you mentioned briefly the blog should preferably mm -hmm. be forward slash off the domain. Um, can you elaborate on what you mean by that? You know, whatever the way this, this it's set up now, I would leave it. But if you don't have a blog on your website, it's usually best to have it forward slash rather than being on a subdomain. Um, you know, you just get more credit from your overall domain in terms of building out pages, overall popularity of it. You know, if you are on a subdomain, that's not a bad thing. You can still be on your subdomain. And you can also incorporate, you know, internal anchor text links from, from blogs to point back at specific pages to help, you know, get that extra movement, uh, matching parameter anchor text links. Those can be important. Don't overdo them, of course. Make sure they're done very naturally. But ideally, if you don't have a blog, you want to create one, yeah, put it on the forward slash. Got it. Thanks. Um, we have time for a couple more questions here. Um, is it better to have a consistent branding strategy across multiple platforms or to customize depending on the platform? Uh, I, I should have assumed that one was for me, sorry. <laughs> um, I, we, 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 we like the, uh, the consistent branding across all of them. Um, in terms of different algorithms, uh, your keyword approach may be different. So like Amazon's algorithm is a little bit different than eBay's. Um, but in terms of your branding, your branding should always be consistent uh, and, and really not changing in any way. You might want to tweak like different, maybe like different lifestyle photos on eBay versus like Amazon to change it up a little bit. But otherwise, we think that you should keep the voice and the branding, the look, the coloring, your logo, everything should be the exact same on every marketplace and every uh, platform that you're on. Great. Thanks, Andrew. 
Um, let's yep. do one last question here. Uh, what metrics do you use to measure branding and SEO? So I guess you can all take a, a stab at that one. Brett, you want to start? You want me to start? <laughs> uh, yeah, can you say that one more time for me, please? What metrics do you use to measure branding and SEO? Yeah, you, you can go ahead and start on that one if you like, Andrew. <laughs> yeah. So that one, is, so to, to me, branding is building a community of people that believe in your product or your, or your brand. Um, so if you had to like go, okay, how strong is your brand? Well, I need to give you a number. It's X. I would say you'd look at social followers, social followers as well as your email list. Um, those are the two like solid metrics where you can go. I have X amount of whatever, like because page traffic, things like that. You, you could just be running ads to anyone and everyone, so you really wouldn't say that that's branding. Um, and you can't really measure brand awareness for people out there who just know your site but don't have social or email for whatever weird reason. But I think if you needed a specific metric, I would look at uh, social followers and then email it. Great. Yeah. Yep, and on the SEO side of things in terms of metrics, you know, really getting very granular in analytics. At the end of the day, guys, it's all about profit, you know, and, 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 and revenue. So really in order to get there, um, having a very strong first page presence for a lot of those very important keywords, you know, as you build those keywords, that's when you'll start seeing all the organic traffic come through analytics. And then, of course, as everything is tracking correctly in analytics, it'll all be about revenue. But I would say really KPIs that we focus on a lot with our clients. It's first page presence, um, organic traffic and users, and then organic revenue. You know, of course, we get into, you know, bounce rates and transactions, all that kind of stuff. But I think in the day, it's those three things. Yeah, keywords, traffic, and revenue. It, actually, in, in terms of metrics for SEO, I, I actually have a question for you, Brett. Yeah. Uh, Moz ranking or Alexa ranking or other? Oh, that's always a good one. I, 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 oh, out of the two, I'd say Moz for sure. Yeah. You know, of course, they both use toolbars and whatnot to track a lot of stuff, but you know, I, I'd say probably Moz is better than Alexa. But you know, they're just numbers, of course. Um, you know, there's yeah. a lot of different look views on things, but I'd say Moz over Alexa. More cool. people are using Moz, I'd say. Yeah, I agree. Good we question, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we are running out of time here, so I'd like to wrap it up. If we can just get um, some closing thoughts from the panel, what is the one takeaway that um, the audience should have from today's discussion? Uh, Brett, why don't you start? Yeah, I think as far as just like I said, what Mike mentioned earlier, you don't want to have all your eggs in one basket. So, you know, having a very strong organic presence is going to be very important. And if you're going to be doing it yourself, or finding an agency, just make sure you're, you're doing all the right things. Because of course, you know, if you don't do the right stuff, you can definitely mess stuff up. But having very good, unique content on your site, and then um, really just dialing in the actual architecture, you know, including all the metadata, is going to be super, super important for the site to get it to perform and be active as well. Be active, great, Andrew. What do you think the audience uh, should take away from today? Um. Immediate takeaway, I would see, I would say, be everywhere you can, look and sound the exact same wherever you are. I like it. Good. Straight into the point. I like that. <laughs> and Mike, if you don't mind closing us off with some closing thoughts for today. Yeah, I, I think the information was was valuable, and I would encourage anybody listening to to engage these guys for further to uh, help themselves. I, 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 we clearly see an investment in marketing for all of our e-commerce companies really does pay off and those that do it well significantly grow sales and, and we certainly would encourage everybody to continue to do that. Thank you. Well, thank you all for joining us. Uh, thank you so much, Brett, Andrew, and Mike for taking some time today to share some knowledge with everyone that's listening in and I wish everyone the best of luck in growing their business and if you do have any questions, um, contact info for everyone will be on these slides and we'll send those out as soon as we can. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thank you. Bye.